Yeah. Hello, my Firestormers. We are getting ready for live. The radio is going to start here in just a moment. I have a great guest tonight who is not in studio. So if you're just coming on, you're going to see that my normal guest seat is empty, but is going to be indeed filled with a really exciting guest tonight. So as you guys are coming on, I want to thank you for tuning in. We have we have less than a minute. <laughs> and always vigilant Colleen, <laughs> the station manager, who takes her own time to come in here and sit and do all the audio. Hey, I, f I feel like I just need to throw it out there. If anybody has uh, a skill set of, you know, audio, um, the sound engineering. Yeah, sound engineering stuff. We really need someone that would just serve in that way. Um, Colleen's been doing this for over six months, and she's wonderful. But uh, we really need to try to find somebody in the next few months, weeks, days. Let me know. Getting started. What if the Christian life is not just about saying a prayer to go to heaven when you die, but a prayer to get heaven into you right now? Have you ever wondered what Jesus meant when he said believers would do greater works than he did? Prepare to be inspired and equipped as you hear regular Christians just like you share their stories of how the Lord is using them to be his love in action. These folks are seeing that love transform the people they encounter as a normal part of their daily lives. And now, Firestorm Live with your host, Scott Gilbert. Good evening, my friends. Firestorm Live show coming at you. And we are so thankful for your, for your time. I know you have a lot of things that you could do. I say it every week. And I know that you are choosing how you spend this hour. And you choose to spend it with us. And may you be greatly equipped. That's what we're all about. We want to equip you to run the great, awesome Christian life that's available. And we show that. We put it on display, right? Jesus said, if I be raised up, I'll call all men to myself. What does that look like? So the Firestorm live broadcast is all about bringing you testimonies from regular Christians, normal, regular people just like you. These are, you know, I have a lot of friends that are in full-time ministry. They're pastors, and, and that's awesome. I, that's awesome. I'm ordained too. But you notice I don't have a lot of pastors on the show. Not because I have an attitude against pastors. I love them. I mean, it's an amazing um, calling. It's an amazing ministry that they do. And f actually, they're way under uh, cared for. So love your pastor recklessly. But the reason I don't have pastors on the show generally is because it's too easy for people to say, well, of course you're praying for people and seeing people saved in the grocery store. You're a pastor. That's your job. That's what you're supposed to do. That's why you signed on. I'm here to say that's all of our jobs. That's the normal Christian life. We don't outsource our faith to somebody else. The, you know, There's only one Holy Spirit. We don't have a hookup. The pastor is not my hookup to the Holy Spirit. He's not yours. So my guests are just folks that are moving in a normal lifestyle. They're not necessarily going to a building with a steeple on top for their job. And my guest tonight... If you're watching on uh, the Facebook Live or on YouTube, you will notice that the chair next to me is mysteriously empty. I do indeed have a guest, and I have an amazing guest, but my guest is in Washington State, Tacoma, Washington. I met John Hauser a couple times this, you know, this year, more than once we've spent some time together at equipping conferences where we just run and encourage people and take them out and show them how to uh, love Jesus and see people saved and see people healed and see people delivered as a normal part of life. And my friend John Hauser is such a fantastic man of modeling how to do this. You know, I feel like there's a lot of folks that are listening that just know instinctively there's more. There's more. I've been in church my whole life. I'm living a life of submission to the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm in prayer. I'm, you know, there, there's no known sin in my life. I, I'm loving my kids and my wife and my family, my husband, whatever. But there's, there's more. It, I feel, I still feel kind of dry. Well, I'm here to tell you that that can be very normal and it can be quickly just 
healed. That can go away really fast. And the way it goes away is when you find out that you are not on this planet to get your needs met by God, but you're actually here to manifest Him and His love for the world every day, everywhere you go. When you start doing that, you start, there is an excitement and an adventure of the Christian life. And my friend John Hauser has got a slew of testimonies. It's going to be amazing. So John, thank you, my friend, so much for joining us as our guest on Firestorm Live tonight. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, I'm just so appreciative to be here tonight. Thank you. Amen. And you took some time. I know it's a few hours difference out there. You're in Tacoma, Washington, right? Actually, Puyallup, but Tacoma is right next to it, and it's a whole lot easier to say Tacoma than Puyallup. I don't even want to try. So, yes, <laughs> thank you for, for joining us tonight. So, John, I'll just introduce you a little bit, and then let's just roll right into what God's doing with you, because I know it's going to excite our guests, our, 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 our listeners tonight. So, Perfect. John, you were in full-time ministry, and the Lord called you out of that ministry, and that's that had to be um, a nerve-wracking time. And in, and what the Lord did is he moved you into a grocery store, secular grocery store. This is not, most people would say, you don't go into ministry, you go work at a grocery store. However, what you were telling me and what you're going to share tonight is that the Lord taking you out of full-time ministry and putting you in the marketplace actually increased the ministry you were actually doing many fold and it is a normal day for you a normal week to pray for 15 or 20 people in the grocery store you're seeing people healed supernaturally you're seeing people redeemed families put back together you're seeing people saved in the grocery store and you saw all this when you got out of full-time ministry is that generally correct that's pretty much it. I went from being a senior ha uh, senior pastor to cleaning bathrooms, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Wow. And you were telling me the timing of that is really just a, a God thing because you got out of full-time ministry. The Lord moved you into the grocery store, and then COVID hit, which yeah. closed our churches, but grocery stores are essential. Exactly. And, you know, as that ministry closed, and I, I'll be honest with you, I started to be a little bit anxious about, Lord, what am I going to do now? Uh, suddenly, my wife and I are both unemployed, and we need an income. Yeah. And I, was, I remember praying one morning saying, Lord, what do I do? Where do I look? And the Lord spoke very clearly to me and said, concentrate your focus on one or two places, either places that provide health care mm like a hospital or places that provide food. And I went, great, I have grocery stores right down the street from me. And that's where I went, I applied, I got on there, and that's, that's where the story starts. Amen. Well, you know, what, what's exciting for me, I wanna get right into, the, right into the meat, which is the testimonies, but you know, as you're sharing that, the Lord is bringing my, my mind to Luke chapter 9, where Jesus sends out the 12. You know, the guys that have been closest to him, Jesus calls them together. He sends them out. They basically go on the, uh, the circuit to all the, the villages that Jesus is about to go to. They're the advance party. They're preaching the good news. They're healing the sick. He gives them authority to uh, cast out all devils and to heal all diseases. It's exciting. And then the next chapter... It's going so well that in Luke chapter 10, he chooses 72 more because they need more people. And what are they doing? They're just going ahead of where Jesus is going to be. And they are preaching the gospel and the harvest. That's where they talk about the harvest is plentiful. Pray for more people to go into the harvest fields. John, I feel like that's exactly what God did with you. He sent you into the harvest field in the grocery store. Yeah, and you're exactly right. And when I went to, I went back into the workforce, I went into the grocery store, I had three goals in mind. I was going to work as unto the Lord, I was going to love the people, and I was going to be the servant of all. 
And I just want to point out to you that you, you, brought, you started off really great. You know, Jesus sent out the 12, but then he sent out the 70. Yeah. And the 70, those weren't the 12. Those weren't the apostles. These were just followers of Jesus, people just like you and me, yeah. people that work in grocery stores. Yeah. Yeah, and he gives them the same authority. He tells them, heal the sick. <laughs> Tell people. He never says, you know, go pray for the sick. He says, heal the sick. Raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers. He gives them a command to go and do what he's doing. And I love it that you're doing it, John. So let's talk testimonies. What's God doing with you on a normal week working in a grocery store? Okay, so on a normal week, um, now I'm no longer cleaning bathrooms. I now work in a check stand. I'm a cashier. Okay. And so I see people come through my check stand all day long. I don't pray for every, every last person that comes through the check stand, but I speak life. I speak encouragement. I ask people how they're going, how their day is going. Um, if they tell me, well, my day is going okay, I, I reassure them, hey, you know what? I'm just confident that your day is going to go better. The rest of your day is going to go better. Okay. And when they ask me how, I do, how I'm doing, I tell them, hey, I'm doing amazing. And what's really interesting is the more I do that, the more people come through the, the check stand that when I ask them how they're doing, it's like it's catching on. Okay. People are coming through saying, hey, I'm doing really good today, or I'm doing amazing. But I have this opportunity to see these people come through, and I'm always watching for an intro. Somebody complaining about not feeling well, somebody in a cast, on crutches, limping, you know, it's kind of like my cue to say, hey, what's going on with this? Uh, one example, I had a, a customer that she came through the store on a regular basis, got to know her a little bit. She came through the check stand one day, and I asked her how she was doing. She goes, oh, I'm doing okay, but I just have this really bad headache. Well, there was my opportunity. And I said, really? I said, I believe God still heals today. I said, can I pray for your headache? And she said, well, okay. So I said, can I have your hand? So I took her hand and I prayed. And mind you, the, the check stand's really busy. I don't have a long time to pray for each person. Right, so you're so keeping it really short. The pain and the headache to leave in Jesus' name yeah. and not come back. And then I asked her, I said, so how do you feel? She goes, wow. She goes, it's a whole lot better. She goes, there's still a little bit there, but she goes, it's amazing. It's a whole lot better. I said, you just wait. By the time you get to your car, it'll be completely gone. I and love that. And then I didn't see her again for probably two, three weeks. Okay. She, she comes back through the, growth, through the check stand a few weeks later, and I ask her. I've been watching for her. I said, hey, remember when I prayed for you about your headache? I said, was it gone by the time you got to the car, like I said? And she goes, it was. She goes, just like you said, it was completely gone by the time I got to my car. Amen. So, John, there is just so many awesome teaching points here. I want you to help unpack for our listeners. So I love it that you started with, I just basically speak encouragement. I just speak life, we call it. Speaking life is just being a positive influence on people, being an encourager. And that's your intro is what I'm hearing. That's generally the way that you engage uh, the okay. folks in the grocery store. Yeah, uh, sometimes it is so amazing what just a kind word will do to a person's countenance. They might be coming in having an okay day, and I see a lady and I say, wow, you know what, your fingernails are really pretty, or your hair looks really nice, or, you, you know, anything. And you can watch it lift their countenance. Yeah. I speak life, I speak mm -hmm. encouragement, and it, it has an effect. My wife is absolutely amazing at that. In fact, she had a testimony from today where she does that. I, I find it's, when, when there's a checkout girl or there's a woman or something talking about her earrings, I just kind of hang back and I let Lynn do that. But um, she was just talking today about being at a coffee shop and the, the young woman that was working there, the way she had her earrings, like in a special way, like high and low or something. And Lynn mentioned it to her about how, how nice that was. And then she uses it as a springboard to say, you know, you are just so reflecting the beauty 
of God right now. His beauty is just pouring out of you. And she watches these women that have never been told that just light up. And I hear what, what you're saying, John. It seems like this is not that hard. It, it really isn't. It's all about paying attention and listening. Listening is really important. I have a young lady that comes through my check stand on a regular basis. And one day she told me, she, she told me why she comes to my check stand. She says, John, I always come to your check stand because you're always so positive and upbeat and I love it. Amen. So let's talk about how that is possible, John, because, you know, we can do, we can do so much in our flesh, in our natural. You know, if, we, if you're just trying to pump yourself up and, you know, speak positive and put on a happy face, man. I mean, while, you know, smile while you're crying type thing. That's not what we're talking about. No. And you said a minute ago, you just listen. So yeah. I think I know what that means. But if you could kind of define um, how you're able to stay positive and encourage people. I, I know you. I know it has nothing to do with your circumstances. It's not about how your day is going. How do you maintain speaking life into people irregardless of what you're personally dealing with? And what do you listen for? I, I listen for anything that I can encourage on. If somebody's coming in and they're having a bad day, I like I said, I try to tell them, hey, I'm confident your day is going to get better. If they've if they're telling me they just lost a loved one to COVID, because I've heard that several times in the check stand, I just tell them, hey, I am so sorry for your loss, and ask them, is there any way I can pray for you? Um, a perfect example might be not, not in the check stand. This happened in the break room upstairs with coworkers. I came in, and there were some ladies in the break room. I asked them all how their day was going. Two of them said good. One said, eh, it's okay. And she goes, she just asked me, she goes, John, why are you always so positive and upbeat? And I said, dear, it's simply the kingdom of heaven that dwells within you. And then it got silent real fast. I love mm -hmm. that. The kingdom of heaven dwells within me. You know, there's a lot of churchianity sayings that people could say at that point. You know, we, we have a certain lingo in the church. Oh, you know, we just go from glory to glory. Okay, what does that mean? Or, yeah, you know, God, li God lives in me. Okay, what does that mean? But I love the way that you put it. The kingdom of heaven lives in me. And I feel like that's just intriguing enough for people to want to know more. So how do you follow up with, yeah, it's the kingdom of heaven that lives in me. Where do you go after that? Well, it, it depends on your response. The, the, in this particular circumstance, my break was short. It was a short break. The room went completely silent. <laughs> and I knew that, you know, there's, I have coworkers thinking, oh, here comes John. <laughs> Nothing gets him down. He's a Jesus freak. And that's okay. I wear that title with a badge as a badge of honor. I am a Jesus freak. I love the Lord. And so a lot of times when things go cold or things go silent, I just let it go. I yeah. don't push. I don't pursue. But I'm always looking for opportunities. So this particular lady, I check on when I before I start my shift. I make sure I go to her department and I say, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? And then I just listen. And I'll look for the opportunity to say, hey, can I pray for you? Sometimes they say yes. Some This this very particular woman, um, I asked her yesterday, just the other day, I was in the grocery store and I saw her and I asked her how she was doing. She said she was doing okay. I asked her if there's any way I could pray for her. And she goes, nah, save it for those who really need it. Okay. Yeah. And at that point, I just let it go and I keep doing my thing yeah. and waiting for the next opportunity whether it's with her or somebody else. And I love the way that you introed, um, you know, praying for the sick. Because, you know, you and I have been doing this for a while and we've shared some cool testimonies together just preparing for the show. 
I find, and I, I, there's a question here for you, in my experience, people are very interested in sharing with you their hurt, like their owie. What did they do to themselves? Oh no, what happened to your knee? Oh no, what's up with your shoulder? If they're in, you know, like an obvious shoulder harness or something. Um, I found that's just being friendly. It's not prying, it's friendly that people want to tell you, oh, I was playing, you know, sand soccer with my son and I fell and twisted my ankle and that's why I'm in the crutches. The way you introduced it was, I believe God still heals today. I love that statement because to me it seems like there's a curiosity factor there. I believe God still heals today. Have you, do you find that leading with that, I believe God still heals today, is that a opener to continual dialogue? Absolutely. And I don't always use that. Sometimes I'll just say, when they're telling me about something, I'll just say, hey, can I pray for you? Okay. And I, I've had very, very few people say no. Yeah. But the story, the way you just prefaced it, that just brought to my remembrance another incident of someone that I prayed for. He came through my check stand. He had his arm in a sling. And I just simply asked him, hey, man, what's going on with your, with your arm? And he says, oh, he goes, I just had shoulder surgery. And he goes, I'm trying to heal up. And then I just said, hey, I believe God still heals. Can I pray for you? And he said, well, sure. So I prayed for him. He says, thank you. He goes on his way. I don't see any instant manifestation. You know, he didn't say, hallelujah, I'm healed, and throw his, throw his sling down on the ground. He just went on his way. Three days later, he comes back through my check stand, and I don't recognize him because he didn't have his sling. Awesome. And so I, so he says to me, he says, hey, do you remember me? And I go, um, maybe. I see a lot of people come through the check stand. He goes, you prayed for me about my shoulder, remember? He goes, check this out. And he takes his arm and he sticks it straight up above his head like it was never hurt. And I go, man, isn't God good? And it was just, it was awesome. It was awesome. And that is for the unique, elite, few, anointed? Or is that available for every believer? It's, Jesus said in John 14, 12, he says, because you steadfastly believe in me, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater work shall you do because I return to my Father. It's for all believers. It's for all believers. In fact, as I was, you and I were talking earlier before the show the other day, and we were talking about um, Matthew 17 and Matthew 9. And at the end of Matthew 9, after the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, after Jesus had cast the, the epileptic demon out of the boy, they're walking down the road and the, the disciples are kind of arguing amongst themselves who's going to be greater. And the Apostle John speaks up to Jesus and says, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we forbade them. Now, I want you to think about that. The disciples saw someone casting out demons in Jesus' name. So this someone must be a believer because he was using Jesus' name to cast these demons out. Well, what was Jesus' response? He said, don't forbid them. Those who are not against us are for us. In other words, he's using my name. He's exercising the authority of my name, whether he is part of the 12 or following us or not. Let him exercise the authority of my name and let him destroy the works that the devil is doing in those people's lives. And so it's for the believer, those who believe. Yeah, and that's the that's the bar. The bar is, are you a believer? And I think that needs to be, in some ways, clarified. Okay, well, what do you believe? Do you believe that I said a prayer, so I'm going to go to heaven? Because Jesus never told anybody to say a prayer to go to heaven. He said, follow me. He said, anyone who would come after me must first deny himself. So 
what do you believe? And I just want to encourage listeners right now that what if, what if we don't say a prayer to go to heaven when we die, although you're going to go, that's the, 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 that's going to happen. That's not the goal. What if we say a prayer to get heaven into us right now, and then for the rest of your life, you manifest he who lives inside of you. Don't you know that the very spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you? You manifest that in this world as he is in this world, so are we. What if that's the Christian life? Not just getting people in a headlock to say a prayer to go to heaven, but getting a prayer to get heaven into you. And then recreationally, John, we crush the works of the enemy, see the sick healed, see the dead raised, see people cleansed of terrible diseases as a normal part of our everyday life, not just when we're in the four walls of the church. Is that available to every believer? Absolutely. The second half of one of my favorite scriptures, and it's a contrasting scripture, is John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the devil. That's the kingdom of darkness. Jesus says, but I came to give you life and to give it to you abundantly. Now, that abundantly doesn't mean that it, that's not just when you die. Yeah. That's abundant life here and now. Jesus said that eternal life was that we may know the Father mm -hmm. and the one that he sent, his son, Jesus. That's, etern that's eternal life. That's the abundant life. That's stepping out in faith and seeing the, the sick healed, the dead raised, the lepers cleansed, demons cast out. That's the abundant life that Jesus was talking about. Because that's what he modeled. A normal day in the life of Jesus, and we just read through a bunch, but if you just go to, where were you? Matthew 17. Yeah. I love Matthew 17. You got the transfiguration. You've got Jesus healing a demon-possessed boy. You've got... You know, all these things are going on. Same thing in Matthew 9. I mean, it's all over. The, just a day in the life. Jesus is just going about his life, and he's healing a paralyzed man. And then he's, uh, you know, talking about fasting, and then he's healing again. Uh, then he's got blind eyes open, healing the blind. I mean, this is a day in the life. And yeah. it was really easy for me as a believer for most of my adult life to say, well, of course, of course, he's Jesus. Of course he can do that. He's God. I'm not God. Therefore, and how audacious, how, how terrible would that be for me to say? I can do the same things he can do. No, no, no. He's God. I'm a fallen sinful man. But wait a second. What if Jesus did everything he did not to show us what he could do, but to model and to demonstrate what we would do, and he just lived it every day? That's what that, really changed my life. That was, that was the commission that he said, go out, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely give, yeah, it's Matthew 10. And it's available to every single believer. So, John, let's talk about some more, let's talk about some more testimonies in the grocery store. Um, sure. You know, in, in varying levels of spectacularity, what I love about you is, you know, just, it's a low bar. We just start with speaking life. So you don't have to go into this. People that are new at this and maybe a little nervous, let's just do baby steps. So we start with just being kind and speaking life. We see where that goes. And then the next level, I would say, is they're going to share with you their need on some level if you're just being attentive to what they're talking about. People are very, you can read it on them a lot of times. And, and what you were saying is you listen. So you listen to them, but are you also hearing anything in the Spirit? Is the Lord giving you information on people? Of course. When I see somebody, as, as soon as I see somebody and I notice something visually, then I know, I know in my spirit that I want to pray for that person. And I'll confess to you that there have been times when I either thought things were too busy and I didn't have time or 
maybe it was a little too hard and I missed a chance. Yeah. And I don't let that bother me. I learn from my situation and I go on to the next person. But I'm trying to be the servant of all. So I'm listening, I'm watching, I'm looking. Um, another time I prayed for a lady. She was looking for something that she couldn't find in the store. I just happened not to have any customers. I went and took her to where it was. I was being a servant, showing her where it was. We found what she was looking for when she reached for it. I noticed that she had uh, a gauze pad on her arm and some tape down to it. And I said, hey, this what's going on with your arm. And she goes, oh, I just had to have some blood work done. She said, I've had a lot of back surgeries and um, I'm in a lot of pain. And she goes, for some reason, the, the blood the blood work was to try to figure out, for some reason, every once in a while, my body retains water, and she goes, my ankles will swell up, and I will gain like 15 pounds when my ankles swell up. Well, there's my entry. And it always come because, it all came because I was being a servant, I saw something, and I asked the question. And most of the time, people will just spew out what's going on. I, I had no idea, so I just asked her, I said, hey, I said, I would really love to pray for you. I believe God's still healed. I said, can I pray for you? And she goes, oh, yes, would you? I mm -hmm. said, can I have your hand? I, said, I took her hand. I prayed for her. I prayed for God to heal her back, give her a brand new back. I prayed for the swelling to go away and never return. Didn't see anything immediately. But I saw the woman's countenance just jump. And when it was all, when I was finished praying for her, I said, you know, Jesus loves you so much. I said, sis, can I give you a hug? And she goes, absolutely. I give her a hug. I go back to work. I leave her right there, and I head back to work. I get halfway down the aisle, and I hear her audibly say, thanks, God, I really needed that. Now, I didn't see any miraculous manifestation of healing. But I believe that when I pray, whether I see anything or not, I know that God hears. Mm -hmm. And if he hears, he grants me the petitions that I've asked of him. I know he's doing something, whether it's just showing love and compassion, whether it's just speaking life, or whether he is going to heal that person and she's going to be another person that comes back through the check stand and says, you remember when you prayed for me? Yeah. That's one of my favorite things to hear while I'm in the check stand when somebody comes up and says, hey, you remember when you prayed for me? Yeah. I love it. And that's available to every believer. Hey, if you are just tuning in right now, you are listening to the Firestorm Live broadcast. I'm your host, Scott Gilbert, and it is my honor every week to share with you testimonies of regular believers just like you that are praying for people, being the hands of Jesus, moving in love every day as part of their normal life. They're praying for people in the line of the bank. They're praying for the barista. They're praying for people in the checkout stand at the grocery store. They're praying for people in the parking lot of the Home Depot. All of these normal parts of life. And I tell you what they're seeing, they are seeing people just like my guest just shared just come alive and light up because that person knows that they have, they're loved, that God loves them, that God sees them. Yes, we're seeing people supernaturally healed and we share those testimonies and it's amazing. And yes, we see people rededicate their lives. Yes, we've seen families get back together, um, broken families that are now back together just because somebody connected with a stranger in the Lowe's parking lot made a connection prayed a blessing over them in the name of Jesus. And you know, God says that my word will not return void. So when we put it out there, Jesus is the word. It says in John 1, 1, Jesus is the word, right? The word was with God. The word was God. He came and he dwelt among us. So whenever we share the word, we're sharing Jesus and Jesus just moves in power. 
That is what the Firestorm Live broadcast is all about. And it is my honor to encourage you and to equip and hopefully provoke you to step into the fullness. Run with us. We're going to have a few opportunities coming up where you can come and do this with us. We call it Love in Action. You can come and just hang with us. It's coming up this weekend on Saturday, the uh, the 30th of... Uh, or the 31st of July, this Saturday, 6 p.m. We're going to meet at the Oceanfront Library down in Virginia Beach, the Oceanfront Library. We'll meet there at 6 o'clock. We'll get everybody together. We'll do a little connection, praise and worship, get the, get the atmosphere, bring the spirit, the presence of God already lives in us. But when we all join together, it just seems to amplify. And then we're just going to go walk around. We're just going to walk the boardwalk. We'll pray for people. Some people will probably go have a meal, pray for waiters. It just It's very natural and organic. So if you would like to be part of that, if you would like to come share that with us, even if you've never done it before, that's the best time. So you can find all this information on our website at firestormunited.org and on Facebook at Firestorm United. We share testimonies, we share ways to get a hold of us and connect with other people that are living this way normally. And we're just so thankful for 89.1 FM, the word in praise that is hosting our show, coming to you out of Cheriton, Virginia. And my guest tonight is John Hauser. John lives in Washington State outside of Tacoma. And John was in full-time ministry. And the Lord took him out of that, put him in a grocery store right before COVID, uh, where he started at the bottom, cleaning bathrooms. He said he went in there with the heart of a servant, and it is normal for John in his capacity working in a grocery store, praying for people every day. It is normal for John to pray for 15 to 20 people a week and see people healed normally, regularly. John, I want to thank you for being with us. And I want to go to kind of an awkward topic. I got to be honest with you. This is the stuff that people don't ever talk about. But I'm going to talk about it because I'll never lie to you listeners. I'm going to tell you exactly as it is. And a lot of people are thinking, what do I do when I pray for someone and I don't see them healed? Some people say, what do you do when you pray for them and they don't get healed? I don't like to say you pray and they don't get healed. You pray and you might not see it. You might It might not manifest in a way that your five senses can receive. But John, what do we do? I know I'm certain you've had many experiences, as have I, when we pray for someone and we don't see a change. How do you handle that? Well, you, you know, I just continue to press on. I keep pressing on, moving forward. If I pray for somebody and I don't see anything, it doesn't change the gospel message. It doesn't change the truth of God's word. When I pray, I expect something to happen, whether I see it or not. And I'll be honest with you, I, I absolutely abhor cancer because it's killing people left and right every day. And I'm sick of praying for people with cancer and then dying. Yeah. I, it just makes me sick in my heart. But I don't let that deter me. When I pray for somebody and I don't see anything and things don't go the way that I had hoped, I press forward and it makes me more determined to pray for that next person who can. I love that because it's almost like you're flipping the script. Um, when I, uh, just a real personal testimony, we had a, a young woman that actually ended up staying at our house for five or six weeks. She was getting a new job. Her apartment wasn't quite ready. Uh, one of my wife's, you know, ladies prayer groups said, hey, we have this young woman. She needs a place to stay for one night. No problem. We have a guest room, private bath. It's all good. Well, she ended up staying with us for like six or seven weeks because of a series of malfunctions in apartments and housing and all these things. So we got to know her really well. Lovely, lovely young woman. Loves the Lord. Um, more of a traditional background with the Lord, but that's okay. And her mother is a cancer patient. And her mother was in the hospital. And I shared with our friend that was staying with us, oh, I'd love to pray for your mom. Okay, so they worked that out and got her on speakerphone in the hospital. And it was bad. 
uh, she's had cancer for many years and she's not very old and it was just really sad and my wife and I we prayed for this lady and I have seen the Lord do this exact same thing uh, I've seen the Lord so this woman was having breathing problems her lungs are filling up uh, cancer is ravaging her body all she wants is to be able to breathe I have seen this exact same thing prayed for a woman who was at death's door prayed for her and the Lord in a moment clears out her lungs the oxygen starts flooding her body uh, the fluids seep out and she gets released 24 hours later that's in a show in the in the history of firestorm if you look through that was a uh, Haley Williams shared that testimony. I have seen this before. So I share that testimony with Laura's mom. I share that testimony and I say, you know, I've seen God do this before. I'm building faith. I'm building expectation. And we prayed for her and we prayed three times, no change. And three days later, she went home to be with the Lord. And I hate it. I have no I hate death. It's the it's the enemy that's already been defeated. But when I don't see it, it really bothers me. So what the Lord has taught me, and this might just be a teaching point for listeners, what the Lord has taught me is if you want to move in doing what Jesus did, if you want to move in that, you have got to get comfortable with when you don't see it. You've got to learn to move in that. Because if you think, it's like learning to fish. If you think you're going to throw the line in the water with a worm on the end and you're going to pull out a fish in 90 seconds, which is what everybody hopes, then you're not going to be a very good fisherman. You're not going to fish for very long. There is a, there is a level of just leaning into it, leaning into the mystery of, Lord, you said, heal the sick. I can't heal anybody, Lord, but you live in me and you said to heal the sick. So when I pray for someone and I don't see it change, that is an opportunity to check your faith and say, okay, is my faith in what I see or is my faith, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. So Lord, I'm just going to trust you and I'm going to go pray for two more. That's what I do. I take it as I just got hit and I'm going to hit back two more times. So I look at it as warfare. John, how do you handle it when you pray for someone and you don't see a manifestation or a loved one dies or you were sharing with me a story of praying for a sweet five-year-old little boy? You want to share that one? Yeah, uh, it was really hard. Uh, it, was a, 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 it was actually the grandmother of the young boy and she called me and asked me if I would be willing to come up and pray for her son at Children's Hospital. Um, her daughter was a brand new believer and they were coming from a background of uh, Hinduism. And I, I later found out that the, the boy in his bedroom actually had idols of Hindu gods in his bedroom. Um, anyway, he came down with cancer in his brain. Uh, myself and a friend of mine went up to pray for him. And here's this precious little boy. And he can, the, the, the cancer has advanced so far. The doctors have given him no hope. He can't talk anymore about the only thing he can do is cry. Mm -hmm. And he'd be peaceful for a little while and then he'd cry. And we prayed and we prayed asked the Lord to heal him and we came against the spirit of cancer and we did everything that we were trained to do and we walked away from that going okay God do what we can and then turn around and several weeks later I get the phone call my precious boy has passed and at that point your heart just sinks and there's a moment there where you feel defeated and you can't stay there. Listen, when I pray for somebody and the Lord heals them right there in front of me, I don't get credit. Amen. When I pray for somebody and they, they don't get healed, I don't get to take the blame either. Yeah. I pray in faith. 
I don't let it stop me. It doesn't change the gospel. It doesn't change the truth. But it does change the desire in me and makes me more intent on wanting to pray for that next person. Learn and keep striving and keep pressing forward. So when we pray for someone and we don't see a manifestation of healing, we don't see it change, or worse, they die, that should actually spur us on to do more, is what I'm hearing you say. Absolutely. I mean, I wish, it's my heart's desire to see everybody heal. Yeah. And Jesus was 100%. Yeah, he never missed. He, he healed every single one. All the time. He said, I only do what my Father shows me to do. I only speak what he tells me to do. Therefore, being he prayed for the sick and cast out demons and they all left, I believe that it is God's will to heal everyone. Everyone. Yeah, I think every that's a great God. point, John, because... A lot of times we get our idea of what God's will is, I think, from our track record of perceived answered prayers. And like I said before, we don't have the capacity to gauge the answer to our prayers. We only have five senses. But we get our idea of what God's will is by a history of prayers. Well, instead of getting our idea of what God's will is from Jesus, who was the will of God, Everything he did was the will of God. Everything he said, he said, like he, he only said what he heard the Father saying. He only did what he saw the Father doing. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So you want to know what the Father's will is? Jesus healed everyone every single time. So therefore, that must be the Father's will. So when I don't see it, what do I do? For me personally, I never ever blame the sick person. I think that's Amen. absolutely demonic, right? Jesus never blamed a sick person. And so I just turn around and say, okay, my faith has to grow. You know, I've had people, it gets me a little emotional thinking about it. I've had people that have contacted me and asked me to pray for them. And in bad situations, just our friend Laura, her mom, just a couple of weeks ago. And I can't help but think, you know, I pray for them and we don't see a manifestation of healing. We don't see it change or they die. And I just feel like, Lord, they came all this way for you and all they got was me. Yeah. And that spurs me on to be yeah, like, okay, Lord, whoever would come after you, you said was first deny himself. Okay, Lord, less of me, more of you. That's what John the Baptist said. I must decrease. He must increase. I personally take it as an opportunity to be, okay, Lord, less of me, more of you. I need to get alone with you more so that they don't get any me. They don't get any Scott. They only get Jesus pouring out of me because I've been in connection with him. So I try to use that as a catalyst to just launch me more into intimacy in the secret place with the Lord. Absolutely. How, how about you? When uh, what is what does it look like for you to prepare to go into work every day? I mean, do you have to get all prayed up? Do you have to fast three days a week? I mean, what's it what's it look like for for John Hauser to prepare for a day at, at the office? Well, well, I do I do fast. Um, but something that I believe is, listen, our fasting doesn't move God. Yeah. Our fasting moves our flesh out of the way so that we can hear and have intimate relationship with God. Okay? When I leave for work, and, and, and I, I, I don't want to tell people how much I fast or how often I fast because it's not a, it's not yeah. a method. It's not a recipe. Right. It's a personal issue between me and, and the Father. But when I leave for work, uh, I'll jump in the truck and, uh, and I'll head down, head down the, out of my subdivision and I'll start talking to God. Okay, Lord, thank you for another opportunity to shine for you. Lord, set up a divine appointment. Bring the people through my check stand that you want me to minister to and let me be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's how I start my day. 
And there's a lot of times it's kind of interesting because there's warfare going on there. I get ready to punch in, and sometimes it's almost like without anticipation I get a knot in my stomach. Yeah. Until I get in the check stand and I talk to that first customer. Hey, how's your day going? Really? That's good. I'm glad to hear you're doing good. Oh, I'm doing amazing. And everything settles and the Lord just, the, the Holy Spirit just flows from that. You know, that's, I think that's, that's a, my normal routine when okay. I head into work during the day. I think that's an awesome teaching point on that, John, because... Uh, I've noticed the same thing with me is that when I it's almost like when you're getting ready to go into the ring or something and you're all trained up and you're ready and you're in shape and you got all the you know you're prepared and then there's so many nerves that hit you at that point a lot of it's easy to read that as oh I'm doing something wrong you know you clock in you get a sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach or you know something negative has happened with you personally that you can't stop thinking about what I've learned is that's actually my enemy that's hitting me because he knows, he sees the anointing. He sees what could be coming, and I can destroy his kingdom. He, I always caveat, the enemy doesn't have a kingdom because he's not a king. At best, he's a prince. He's not, a, he's not equal with God. He's equal with Michael. He's just an angel. In fact, the word says that, and you know, there's going to come a time when we're going to look at him and we're going to say, that was the one? That was the one that, you know, took over the whole world? That little nothing? So yeah. the enemy, but what he does is he projects his stress and his fear onto us, and then he accuses us because he is the accuser he accuses it of being our feelings so what i've learned is that when you feel that way it means you're doing it right that's actually a key to success and you just walk right through it and you'll find that that's kind of a clue that the anointing is flowing if you don't feel scared if there's not a nervousness if you don't feel kind of weird you're probably not doing it right. Amen. Yeah. So I like to flip it on uh, on the enemy. You hit me, I'm going to hit you back three times. The way I know you're hitting me is because I got this nervousness that I didn't used to have. I got this anger, irritation. I'm irritated. I'm not anger, but I'm irritated all of a sudden. Oh, wait. That's not me. That's my enemy is irritated. Yeah because he sees what's coming and he can't do anything about it. He's a withering branch coming to nothing. He's cut off from his life source. In fact, he's getting less and less and less because he's cut off with, from a life source. We're going from glory to glory. He's draining more and more. So yeah, we have, John, we've got a little less than 10 minutes left. I'd love anything that the Lord puts on you just to encourage our listeners. Um, I just feel like there's people listening that have walked with the Lord. They love Jesus. They have prayed the prayer. They're serving in ministry. They're serving in the church. They're loving their families. They're in the word. They're doing everything that they think they could be doing. But if you could just encourage them of how can they join in, get out of the bench, get off the sidelines, is there more? What would you encourage them? How would you talk to them? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because um, I've been praying about I've been praying about certain scriptures, and I'll share one here in just a minute. But every time I think of that, trying to encourage per a person to step out in faith, to overcome their fears of well, what happens if I pray and nothing happens, or what happens if they tell me no, or what happens if I offend them. Listen. There was a time when the apostles were crossing the, the Sea of Galilee and Jesus comes walking on the water and they're all freaked out thinking it's a ghost and, and Peter, I love Peter, he steps out and says, Lord, if that's you, command me to come out with you on, out, out to you on the water. Twelve people in the boat, only one got out. And Peter walked on water yeah and he was doing good until he took his eyes off jesus and started paying attention to the wind and the waves and then he began to sink but 
there was Jesus right there to stretch out his hand, pull him up and say, hey, why did you doubt? Don't let fear or doubt deter you. Press through. The disciples, when they prayed for that, that man's son who had an epileptic spirit and nothing happened, that was a first for them. Jesus had sent them out, to, and they came back pretty excited, saying, you know, that people are getting healed, demons are subject to us in your name. But this one particular incident, nothing happened. What was Jesus, what did Jesus tell him? And I've been meditating on this. You'll see this verse in uh, Matthew 17, 17, and you'll see it in in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9 as well, Mm -hmm. where it seems like Jesus is giving his disciples a a rebuke, and he says, O faithless and perverse generation, how much longer will I bear with you? Well, right there he's telling them what the problem was, their faith. Something inter- interjected into their faith, and doubt came in. And he calls them a perverse generation because they were thinking with that twisted mindset. They weren't looking at the Lord. They were looking at the situation, and when nothing happened, they started to freak out. Yeah, I and love as- I love what you're sharing. Go, go ahead. Yeah, we, we just have a couple more minutes, but I just wanted to, to work in a sidebar here. You know, this is after the Mount of Transfiguration. This is after Jesus has sent out the 12, sent out the 72. And you got to know that these guys, they were more acquainted and more educated with deliverance and healing than any other group in the history of the world. They had seen more. They had lived it. They had done it themselves. They were the pinnacle on the planet at the time, and they couldn't manage this demon in this uh, this par- this boy that was um, the, um, after the Mount of Transfiguration. He comes down, and the Father says, "I brought him to your disciples, and they couldn't do anything." And what I love about this, a teaching point, is what do you do when you don't see him healed? You know what the apostle, the disciples did? They pulled Jesus aside, and they say. How come we couldn't? And Jesus doesn't smack them down. Jesus says, yeah, this kind comes out with prayer and fasting. Jesus calls out the demon having neither fasted nor prayed. At the moment, he didn't do any of this. But he had done them. He had been filled in that level. And I think what he's telling the disciples is, you got to train for this, guys. I mean, you got to train. You got to put your heart into this. And training looks like connect with the Father the way I do, fasting, prayer, intimate time with the Father. I love it that Jesus didn't smack them down. So, John, in the last three minutes that we have left, uh, I would love it if you would pray for our listeners, anything the Lord gives you, and then just any kind of closing thoughts you have. Okay. So before I pray, yeah. I, I, uh, as, I was, as I was meditating on that scripture, Jesus saying, O oh, faithless and perverse generation. Mm-hmm. I do this little prayer march around my the lower part of our of our house. And as I was praying and I'm meditating on this scripture, the Holy Spirit just speaks to my heart and says, It's time for a generation to rise up and to be faithful and unperverse, untwisted. And we're seeing that happen all over the place with common, everyday people who are willing to step out of their comfort zone and pray for somebody in Jesus' name. No matter what happens, they step out of their comfort zone, they pray in Jesus' name. People are getting healed, people are getting delivered, people are getting saved, and we're seeing it happen all over the place. This is that generation that will be faithful and unperverse. Amen. And you can be a part of it. So, John, in about the last minute, yeah, could you pray us up for that? Okay. So, Lord, I just thank you and I praise you for this opportunity. 
Lord, you love us so much, and you have given us a command to pray for people, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the lepers, and to cast out demons. Freely we have received from you, O God. Freely we need to give. So I pray right now that the people listening to the sound of my voice would be encouraged, that they would be strengthened to know that they know that they can step out and pray for a perfect stranger and God will be right there with them. And healings will happen, deliverances will happen, salvations will come, and the name of Jesus will be glorified. So I pray, Father God, that you would just activate everybody in the sound of my voice right now to do the work that Jesus did and greater works let them do because you have returned to the Father. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for listening to the Firestorm Live broadcast. If you'd like to try this with us, we will be down at the Oceanfront Library on Saturday at 6 p.m. That's the 31st of July. Meet us at 6 p.m. We'll all break up, go walk around. It's fun, and we will see the hands of Jesus touch people. Thanks for listening. Bless you all. Listening to Firestorm Live with your host, Perfect. Scott Gilbert. Perfect. Presented every Tuesday Perfect. from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. by Firestorm United. A collaboration of activated believers just like you. Moving. All right. So thank you for everyone that's still online. You're kind of in the underground right now. Thank you for, I got some, some good feedback, some comments. Maybe you can see them. Uh, Calvin Allen works in. Um, he says, that's why you don't lie. Thank you for noticing that, Calvin. It's a special thing for me. I just want, I'm going to be totally honest and transparent with people, um, not even to the enemy. So we don't lie even to the enemy. Your feelings are not who you are. We overcome evil by doing good. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I feel like Jesus, you know, it says in James that, you know, how do we, how do we resist the devil? Well, we submit to God. We don't resist the devil. We don't even bother with him. We just submit to God. So we submit to God more and you'll, you will resist the devil and he will flee. So, uh. Pull more into the Father, and you will see those attacks of the enemy. They just fall away. What if ti every time uh, the enemy squeezes you and stresses you and puts pressure on you, what if every single time he squeezes you, he gets Jesus on him because it just comes out of you? What if that was your norm? If I was your enemy, I'd stay away. If every time he squeezes you, you get Jesus, he gets Jesus all over him, ah, I think that would be uh, that would be negative. So. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for listening. We would love to have you join us. So we will be sending Firestorm teams out this Saturday. We're going to meet at the Oceanfront Library, a uh, nice parking lot close to the beach uh, on six, at 6 p.m. this Saturday, the 31st of July. Uh, we would love to meet you. I'd love to meet some of our listeners. I'd love to spend time with some of you guys. You know me a little bit, but I've never met you. Uh, other of our Firestorm, just superstars, promise to be there you can meet some other folks that are just moving in this naturally and i just i know it'll encourage you so come out and run with us it'll be fun thanks for listening and thanks for being a part of the firestorm team you can follow all of this on firestormunited.org you can see some show notes and the history of you know different shows and things and we'd also love to connect with you on there and know how we can be praying for you and encouraging you thanks for your time bless you we'll see you next week